Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and begin uh, the meeting for the Racial Identity Profiling Advisory Board. But before we begin, uh, I just want to make a quick announcement. Uh, I want everyone to understand that this meeting will be recorded and posted uh, on the RIPA Board's website. Uh, information about the website is there, so the meeting is recorded at all times. I'll turn it over to uh, Reverend McBride for some opening comments. I want to say good morning to everyone who is here today. Shalom. Thank you, Reverend. We are, we are sitting here. This one. We're sitting here today um, amidst a lot of pain and trauma um, across the state of California. For many of us uh, who've been sitting in this room, we have been on the streets, on the freeways, in front of sports games, trying to figure out how we convince the system of government inside California that black and brown people are human. So I'm just going to name that um, for me in this moment, I am sitting in that tension. Today in, in the city of Sacramento, our brother Stefan Clark is being buried today. He was shot and gunned down in his grandmother's backyard. 20 shots were fired at him and he was unarmed. It is an injustice that continues to happen and is the reason that this body was formed, is the reason that the community led to pass this law. And every time we find ourselves in one of these moments, we keep hearing people telling us to exercise restraint, to wait for more information to come out, and to keep calm. My question in this seat that I sit in is, at what point where our, will our law enforcement partners exercise restraint, wait for more information to come out, and to use calm? So we're, we're sitting here today, and I just, I just want to hold it because I know this is where I am. I'm sitting here today amidst a lot of tension and a lot of anger and a lot of frustration. For those of us who have sat in these rooms, worked with local law enforcement agencies to try to bring about change, and yet when people who look like some of us who represent minority groups are killed in the streets, we are not getting any kind of justice and we are not getting protection. So as we start off, I want to read some names because from the record that I was able to find, there have been 28 people that have been killed by the police this year in California. There's been one police officer who's lost his life in the line of duty, but there's been 28 human beings whose lives have been taken away by the structures that are supposed to protect them. So I'm going to read their names and I'm going to ask us to hold this in a sacred space, recognizing that some of the names that I'm going to read, family members are sitting here in this room. Jihad Aid, Manuel Borrego, Jontel Reedham, Joshua Pollock, Orion Godbout. Donald McFarland, Jesus Delgado Duarte, Orbel Nazareans, Lloyd Harris, Paul Mono, 
Jason Richard Sienz, Anthony Jacob Weber, Scott Senior, Terry Ammons, Shalun Deke Smith, Thompson Nguyen, Primitivo Macias Rodriguez, Alejandro Valdez, Andy Vo, Shalene Tindall, Ronell Foster, Stefan Clark, and there's six other folks whose names we do not know. I just want to say in these opening remarks, not from a place of arrogance or a place of pontificating to anyone on the board, but we have to find a way to make this stop. And I, I, I hope we will continue to be inspired, as I believe all of us are on the board, to continue to figure out how our work can bring about safety and security and justice for folks who have been most marginalized. And, I, and I'll just close with this opening comment. I really want to put a challenge to our law enforcement partners because we need leadership in these moments. We need leadership. There is no such thing as a blue life because we don't call a UPS driver a brown life. A life is not made up in a uniform. And I want to figure out how do we divest from blue manatee and get back to reclaiming humanity for everybody. I don't want to see anybody die, whether they have on a hoodie or a police uniform. It doesn't have to be this way. So my hope is that we can figure out how to challenge one another to listen longer than feels comfortable and to figure out how we can make some courageous steps so that in these moments, we all don't run to our corners to defend our existing tribe, but we can find some ways to defend just what is right and what is just and what is fair. So my prayer is that we'll have open ears today as we hear sacred stories from folks, as the board discusses um, the work that we have to do. I appreciate y'all for allowing me the space to, to share that we wanna welcome everyone uh, to the official 2018 um, California Racial and Identity Profiling Advisory Board. I'll pass, no 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 pass it over to the co-chair. Great, thank you. Along those lines, we stand as law enforcement officials uh, working on this board together with the amazing people that are represented here to, to seek those things that Reverend McBride just spoke about, to speak about the safety, security, and most important, the justice for everyone represented in these systems. I think we have collectively worked very well together. That does not mean we do not have a lot of work to do, because it is plainly obvious that the work is far from over. But I trust that with the representatives of this board, we will continue to push forward, listen to all sides, and ensure that the best is done for all of us here in California. So thank you, Reverend McBride. And we're moving on now to the next item on the agenda, which is the approval of the December 19, 2017 meeting. I would need a uh, motion uh, from a member of the RIPA board for uh, the approval of the so a motion from uh, Mr. Ali. Second. Second from Judge Lytle. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Are there any abstentions? That motion carries. All right, so now we, we want to uh, get an update from the Department of Justice on the 2018 uh, report release and next steps for the 2019 report. For those that might be newer to this process and to the work of the board, in 2015, uh, community led and passed through their legislators the law Assembly Bill 953, which is moving forward to the collection of data on who's being stopped, why they're being stopped, when force is being used, and this board has served to 
uh, figure out how to determine what information would be collected, how it would be collected, where it would go, how do we have access to it, then also to work on how um, training needed to be implemented to change law enforcement uh, with, with a bunch of other different reforms. So there is a report, um, again, just for folks that are new to this space that was created um, last year. You can find it on the Department of Justice website. Um, I think it's oag.ca.gov, I believe I said it right. And it's, it's on your, the, the link is, the, the web link is on your agenda. Um, and so the Department of Justice, there is a report that, that highlights the work that's been done over the last year and a half or so of, of the convening of this board. So we're going to get an update from the DOJ now about uh, that report and, and even the work that needs to happen for the 2019 report. Um, so mostly I'll actually have our CGIS team do the update on the stop data collection. Um, but yeah, the board put out a report uh, January 1 of this year, which was its inaugural report on the state of profiling in California. Um, the board has a lot of responsibilities, including analyzing the stop data once it starts to come in, analyzing citizen complaint data that's reported to our office, um, working with state and local law enforcement agencies on their policies and doing an analysis of policies, um, and then referencing and utilizing uh, evidence-based research and best practices to inform their work and the recommendations that they put forth. So it's doing, the board is doing a lot of different things, and this first report that we issued really set the stage for um, what's been done so far. As Reverend McBride mentioned, the board uh, advised our office on the development of the stop data regulations. And so the first report outlines what's included in those regulations um, and then also lays out sort of what we've done so far, discussed so far last year um, and what we plan to do in the future. Um, for this year's report, one of the things that will be included in there is our plan for how we will analyze the stop data once it comes in. And so uh, in that vein, I'll turn it over to Audra and her team the stop data collection process, where we are with that. Can, before we do that, um, can to make a quick yeah. comment. You, you know, the board was uh, somewhat struggled with how, you know, robust this report could be without data. So as a result, uh, setting the framework for the data collection, how it's collected in the regulations was really the emphasis of the report. Uh, as subsequent reports come forward, uh, it would be much easier to analyze the data and provide more specificity. So I know there was some disappointment about uh, exactly what could be included, but remember, data collection has not yet begun. So as a result, we were somewhat limited and tried to do our best to represent at least the framework for reports moving forward. From Kelly Evans from the Attorney General's Office, I wanted to uh, thank everyone here from the community and from the board for coming. I see some some friends, so hello. Um, thank you all for coming. And I just wanted to say on behalf of the Attorney General, he thanks you all for coming. Uh, the report, if you haven't had a chance to look at it on that same web link that um, was mentioned, there's also a video that is a uh, worth seeing. It captures some of the very powerful and important testimony that people provided to this board over the past year. Also includes remarks from some of the board members. So if you get a chance, there's not just a, a, a report, but also the video as well. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, like Shannon said, my name is Audra Opdyke uh, from the California Department of Justice. And our responsibility from um, our side is implementing the technology solutions for AB 953. So today um, I have here with me Erin Choi. She's the program manager and, and works on the business side for implementing the technology. And then also Charles Hu, who is from the technical side. Is it working? Okay. So 
So today uh, we will be talking about the three different submission methods um, that we are in the midst of developing for the technology solution for agencies to be able to submit the stop data information. Uh, we will also be going over in detail our web application and providing you some sample screens of that web application. And then um, our next steps moving forward prior to go live implementation date. And then finally, I will provide an overview of the outreach that we've been doing uh, from the beginning of the project until today. So I'll hand it over to Aaron. We have a lot to cover. We have 30 minutes, um, so we're going to get started. Thank you all for your time this morning. Uh, so uh, we just wanted to give a, a little bit of quick background about the different ways that reporting law enforcement agencies will be submitting their stop data to the Department of Justice. So the regulations provided agencies three different ways to give us this data. I, I don't want to bore you with the technical details, but on the other hand, uh, we want to make sure that we're sharing information about the solutions that we're developing. Uh, so the first is called Secure File Transfer Protocol, or SFTP. The second is a system-to-system -system web services type of interface. And then the third option is one that DOJ is building to host a web application for agencies. Uh, so what those first two options mean, the SFTP and web services, uh, basically that means that agencies will collect the data locally first, and then they can submit that to DOJ either in real time or in bulk batch uploads. Um, they can choose from four different formats to send it to us. We're, we're trying to be flexible and support different types of technologies. So one thing could just be via Excel. Uh, there's probably a wide audience where folks have, have used that. Um, and then there's three others that are called CSV, XML, and JSON. Um, but the other thing that we want to reassure um, folks of and also the agency is that when this information gets transmitted to DOJ, it, um, you know, it's just not one-way communication. The submitting agencies will be receiving notifications from us about the, the outcome of their submissions. So they will receive a daily feedback then um, to know what we have processed through our system, what was successful, and if there are any errors, uh, they'll get detailed feedback uh, on those errors to make sure that they're corrected, and if there's any issues between our two systems, uh, that, that they know about those promptly. Um, our main goal with developing the system is to ensure that we are collecting good data, data that hopefully can be, be helpful for, for analysis. So to ensure we have uniform and complete reporting, uh, we've provided a lot of detailed uh, technical documents. Uh, so we produced a technical data dictionary, uh, interface diagrams and system specifications, something that's called a logical data model, which basically is just like a graphical representation of, of how all the data that's being collected is is related. And then the regulations also required that uh, we develop some standardized lists, uh, again, to support you know high quality uh, of the data and making sure it could be analyzed. So some of the standard tables that we needed to develop were to track things like a standard list of cities, standard lists of the offenses, um, and then um, also a standard list of school names if the stop involved a K through 12 public school. Um, the third option that we're developing is a, a web application. So just like any other web site that you may use, um, one key difference is that it's not available via like a public. Somebody can't enter the data from their home. They have to be using a device that's connected to DOJ's secure network. So this leverages the existing way that law enforcement already sends data to the, to the DOJ. Um, we are making that website compatible with multiple different web browsers because uh, there's no one size fits all for exactly how agencies do things locally. Um, so it will work on Internet Explorer, Google Chrome, Mozilla. Um, so we've taken all of that into account. And then we're also in the process of developing an offline solution. So this may happen sometimes if you're using your personal cell phone that you drop out of coverage area. Um, so that may happen when data is being collected out in the field as well. Uh, so if that happens, there'll be a way for the officer to save the data locally. And then as soon as they come back into a coverage area, it can be uploaded into the system. So we want them to be able to capture the data, um, start documenting it while everything is still fresh in their mind, whether or not they have have access to the internet at that time. Uh, 
And then last but not least, um, there's also features to address account management. Uh, of course, you know, our team at um, DOJ will be supporting the agencies, but they will have um, local folks within their agency who can um, add new user accounts as people retire or leave the agency, disable those accounts. So the solution uh, supports that as well going forward for the future. Um, Within the um, system itself, um, you know, the, the prime actor is the officer that's going to be capturing and recording the information, but the solution also allows for um, other types of user accounts as well. Um, so one of the other types of accounts, aside from the officer, is for something that we're calling proxy. So during our outreach, some of the feedback that we got from law enforcement is, you know, there's instances where someone may be assigned to a special type of detail and may not have access to a device. You know, so maybe they are on like horse mounted patrol around the Capitol or something like that. They don't have a smartphone. They don't have a patrol car with a with a laptop. So in those instances, you know, uh, one possible solution that the agency could do is to initially capture the stop record on paper and then either have the officer enter that later or when they return to their office, maybe somebody in dispatch or records would actually key in the data. So long story short, that's what is um, covered by this role of proxy. Um, our system will have detailed information to know who exactly entered the information. If it was the responding officer or if the information was entered on their behalf, uh, that will all be um, documented in our, our system logs. Um, the, the next role that we have is something that's called an administrator. Um, as you may recall from the regulations, um, agencies are responsible for making sure that no personally identifying information on the individuals stopped or on the officer is submitted. Um, so uh, the, the administrator role um, is available to agencies if they want to have a second person review the record later to make sure in those open text narrative fields uh, that no, um, none of that information is being submitted to, to DOJ. Um, the view only uh, would be available um, for someone within the agency who wants to do inquiries. They can't actually change the data, but it might be um, appropriate for somebody who's at a supervisor level to do searches and, and see what's being being recorded into the system. Did you have a question? One quick question. I mean, this is something that comes up a lot. Um, so as, for example, the law enforcement administrator role, if there are changes made, is there a uh, electronic trail to, you know, ensure that the validity of the data and in case, you know, some of the data is uh, changed that there's an audit trail to ensure transparency and accountability to our communities? Yes, ab absolutely. There's a very detailed audit trail, and um, essentially the record, a particular record could only be modified depending on what the status is. Uh, so while the officer is initially reporting it, you know, they are recording information, but once they submit it to DOJ, then at that point, kind of the status of the record changes, and it couldn't be modified after that point of it being submitted to us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. If anyone else has questions, then please is related to Captain Medrano's question. Um, is how secure are these systems and applications in terms of the prevention of uh, unwanted data, unauthorized data coming in, data being taken out? Uh, how, how much can we trust these systems to um, provide us with accurate information that is protected? Yeah, we, we understand that that really has to be like the foundation of this system. There, it has to, there has to be a high amount of confidence in it. So that's why I touched on briefly that it's not something that a person could access from their home computer. It has to be on a device that's connected to our secure network. Um, so that right there kind of... Um, uh, secures it in, in one sense. And uh, then we have very strict rules about um, when things could be altered or if they could ever be altered at all. Um, so once a record is submitted to us, it can't be changed. Uh, while the agency is reviewing it, if somebody else were to change it, we would know exactly who made the change and, and what they changed. Uh, something that we have enforced through the system is that the perception data can only be reported by the officer. That's, oh, that's based on the officer's perception. Uh, so it wouldn't really seem appropriate for anyone else to be able to ever change that data. Uh, so. Like, how are you to ensure that they even get the proper information? The truth. 
Yeah, I understand. So is it okay if I res respond to the public at this sure. time? You yeah. can answer that one question, then we'll ask folks for a public, right, the public comment. In a few minutes, and we're going to ask folks to bring those questions, um, very important questions. Please make sure we bring that to public comment. So I'm not sure if everyone was able to hear the question or not. I think it's an excellent question. Um, she asked um, if, if the information is only being entered by the officer, how would we know if, if they're recording the correct data or, or if it was even accurate? That, right? uh, so um, as far as what's going to be in the system, the, the officers are the ones who's entering it because they're, they're required. But ultimately, once the information is being collected by the local agencies and submitted to uh, Department of Justice, then it does become public. Um, the regulations, you know, outline that the information will be released on DOJ's Open Justice Portal. So that will help make sure there's visibility and, and accountability ultimately to, to what's being submitted, is that it would be releasable to the public at, um, once it's submitted on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. other, other questions from the board? Okay. Questions, comments? Okay. Um, so we also prepared, uh, just for your review today, some sample screenshots of uh, what's going to be in our web application. So even if agencies are using their own local system and are going to be basically sending us the data, um, the same rules will be applied. Um, so their screens, their mechanism of capturing it may look slightly different, but once we receive it, everything is subject to the same rules and, and validation. Um, we have some different scenarios that uh, we can go through if there's questions about that. Um, but basically, uh, to get started, um, the initial screen will capture information about the reporting officer and then the date, time of stop. So everything that's in our system follows exactly what's required by the statute and the regulations. Uh, we are taking steps um, you know, to try to make sure that the, the uh, data can be entered quickly. Uh, so across the top, I've tried to highlight uh, just the actual collection method. So when the information is being entered, uh, it basically it will be done in stages. Uh, nothing can be skipped. Um, the person who's entering the data won't be able to, um, you know, skip over anything that's that's required. So on the top, they'll be navigated through like page by page, step by step to collect all the information that's required in the regulations. Um, uh, next on the right, you'll see these, these small dots. Those are actually questions. Uh, so a user can click on there and get information. Uh, we want to make sure that um, I, again, um, we have high quality of data that, that people actually understand what's necessary. So by clicking on one of those, um, it will expand and give them additional details. Um, most often tie them back to the regulations to explain what a field is so, so they know what's, what's intended. Um, the first uh, section about the officer are things that um, we will be able to pre-populate. So we're working with the agencies um, that are going to be utilizing our system where they can do a bulk upload. So when they initially start using the system, we'll have a, a base of all of this. The officer um, doesn't have to rekey it every single time. Um, if they're not included in that bulk upload, then the first time they enter a record, uh, these fields will be saved for them. They can change them going forward. So for example, one of the things is officer type of assignment. Um, it will be pre-populated to whatever was reported last, but if they get a new assignment, then they can change it at any, any time. So we're just trying to make the process go you know, as, as quickly as, as possible. Um, um, something else that I just wanted to show you is that um, within uh, fields that have drop-down lists from the regulations, those will be presented to the user. Once they start typing in one of those fields, it will kind of drop down and help them select. Um, if a person makes an error on one of the screens, you can see here that there's text in red. Uh, they'll know right away that they typed in something invalid, uh, so they need to correct it. Um, and uh, you know, if they try to exit out and go on to the next field, that error message will still persist. They won't be able to leave this page um, unless they have uh, successfully entered correct information. 
Uh, some of the feedback that we got uh, during our outreach with agencies is that um, if they are collecting this data out in the field, they may start ent uh, start entering something and then have to respond to some type of urgent situation. Uh, so once they complete this first page, uh, they click save and continue. And at that point, it's created a new entry. If they, they need to, you know, change their activity, go respond to a call. Uh, that information is still in our system. We flag it as a, a pending record, but they can come back and finish it later. Um, so at this point, they've kind of completed the minimal needed data to at least get it started. And then hopefully, you know, they, they um, go back and complete it later. Um, will, will the officers be flagged? You have an open, uncompleted. Yes, yes. When they log into the system, then they'll see their um, completed records. They'll see if any pending. If the agency puts um, like supervisors or someone in those administrator roles. They can query the system, make sure there aren't any pending records that are still still there. And are there any practices put in place that that ensure kind of that double line of accountability? For example, if an officer doesn't fill out those forms, are those regularly checked by supervisors, or is that really in local control on the the auditing of that to ensure there aren't uh, several reports that left? are left unfilled and then somehow are, are found later. Yeah. Uh, that's something that we're trying to train the agencies to set up local procedures about how they're going to be monitoring that. Certainly when we implement the new system, that's going to be something that my team starts monitoring just to make sure uh, that those, you know, those kind of things aren't getting lost in the implementation. Um, so uh, after they complete the first screen, they'll move on to the second piece of collecting the data, which is about the location. At the top of the screen, I've tried to show highlighted. At that point in time, there will be a unique identifying record number associated to the record. So we know the, the officer that was involved in stop, in the stop, the date, the time, other key information. At that point, we assign a, a DOJ stop record to it. Um, and then you, um, it also shows the status of, of being pending up there as well well yes I'm wondering you know to Reverend McBride's point if there's a way to um, compel the officer to complete the last record before he can continue with a new record if there would if that's a wise thing to do I would look to law enforcement to tell us that but um, that would be a way to make sure that these are completed that we're not getting lots of partially completed things yeah that, that's an excellent point. At this point in time, we don't force them to do that. Um, again, when they log into the system, they'll see anything that's pending, but we haven't forced them to like close out something before they start something new. Okay. So just, just to flag that again, and maybe just for more conversation, because I, I share that same concern mm -hmm. that if, if there are stops that an officer does not want to be noted for a variety of different reasons, those, those reports could go unfilled. <laughs> And my concern is that if we end up in a position where someone is dead or something happens and then there's a, well, we, we don't have the information. So I just, it is, it is a concern I'm having just around like, how do we ensure that it's not left to local departments to, to oversee that? So if I could just add some like practical mm -hmm. standpoint is, so if an officer is in, it's in the middle of, of filling one of these out and he has to respond to something in an emergency situation, if that record is maintained, it's not uncommon in many of our CAT commuter-aided dispatch and records management systems to allow the officer to move on to the next call, but will require him to go back. Electron it's like an electronic reminder, this has not been completed. And since it has not been completed, it doesn't go away. It stays in there until it has been completed. And I'm assuming that's what you're, you yes. have in place. Yes. Yes. Right. So, and so because this is going to be implemented a number of different ways in the agencies, I'd just like to note for the record that this may be something that the board in, the, in our review of policy and implementation this year that we could ask about when we put out inquiries to law enforcement agencies to make sure that we don't have, a, you know, a, a bulk of incomplete um, questionnaires and that we're tracking for any any gaps that um, might become a trend. Uh, just to go in a little bit more e excellent topics. These are things that we've we've all been discussing internally and, and with the agencies as well. So we definitely understand the concerns. Aaron, I, I have a question. If, yes. if say for instance, like uh, 
Chief Madrano spoke about if the uh, officer or deputy gets a call, they're in the middle of it, and they get a call, emergency, have to take off. If they don't complete it, will, at the end of the shift, will they still be able to log out of the system, or will the system say you can't log out because you have to complete that record, or will it send a flag or some kind of notification to DOJ and say this log, you know, this file is pending, it's not completed, or? Uh, they will be able to to log out of the system just because it's like any other internet website where you can hit the X in the top window and, and it would close. Uh, but those records aren't going away. They, they will always be there. So when they log in the next shift, even if they're, let's say, starting, they're going to be off for two days. Th those records will always be there. Um, within our team, we have um, analysts assigned to work directly with each of the agencies. So I know after go live, that's going to be something that we monitor closely, like I said, just to make sure there's nothing uh, falling in the gaps. But worst case scenario, at the end of the collection period, if there are any pending, th those will still be available. That, Like I said, they're not for any analysis. You would at least know if there is a potential reporting issue with an agency that they didn't close out some records. And at the end of the cycle, there was uh, still a, a, a batch, let's say, of a status of pending, at least there's visibility uh, that there, that might be something that needs to be addressed through more training or for us to understand what operational issues that the agency was encountering that they, they didn't complete those as required. And just for the record, uh, Department of Justice has no problem gently reminding agencies that they failed to complete the report required reporting on not only this, but a lot of different things. So uh, chiefs get letters, uh, incomplete information, resubmittals, errors, and stuff like that. And it's it's definitely something that uh, we should continue to talk about and have the right procedures in place. But I have no doubt Department of Justice will let us know when we haven't completed our responsibilities. Yes. Yeah, just one more before we move on to to uh, another page. Appreciate this, mm -hmm. us getting this this update. I also just want to flag maybe just for some ongoing work as well that we figure out how to ensure that there's potentially some transparency and open public process around where there are reports not being filled. So if there are, you know, because I feel like we always find out about this stuff after. So if there's a trend that's that's suggesting that there's a certain department or there's certain officers that are finding themselves not able to fill out these reports, I, I think us finding a way to track that and make sure that that in, in some way is, is available, um, whether it's department-wide or something, but just, you know, ensuring that we've got some type of accountability and public transparency around that. So you will know, DOJ will know, or CIGIS will know if there are incomplete records. Is that right? If agencies are using our web application, then as soon as they start keying in information, we will know that it's in a pending status. If one of the agencies, or if, if agencies are using those first two methods when they're sending us a batch, uh, we'll know what we have received. Um, we'll know if we have flagged something that there was an error, that they tried to send us something incomplete, that will be flagged. Information will be sent back to the agency uh, for them to correct it. And if they fail to correct it, we will know that they have submitted incomplete records. Uh, the tricky part is, though, we only know what's reported. We we don't know the whole scope of how many stops they should have reported. Right, we don't have that. This is the mechanism for them to report. So if they don't report for some reason, we don't have at this point in time necessarily anything to, to automatically compare that to. Right, but you'll know if, if a record was initiated. Yes. Right. Yes, we will Whether, know. What, either real time because of the web app or when the batch is submitted. And yes. remind me the frequency of the submission of the batches. Um, it is up to the agencies to determine that. In the regulations, or in the initial statute, they're only required to submit on an annual basis. On an annual basis. That's yes. the statutory requirement. Yes, and in the regulations, uh, there was language added to encourage them to submit more frequently. Um, uh -huh. They can submit to us multiple times a day. We will be ready and waiting, but um, the mandate is for them just to submit on an annual basis. And, and to the law enforcement <laughs> leaders on the board, is there um, a standard for you to be sending any other data with any other frequency to DOJ? 
Oh, yeah, we have lots of reporting we do to DOJ um, on a quarterly basis, on an annual basis. Understand, I think it's going to be to the desire of most agencies to use the web portal to the extent possible because um, it's, easy, it's the easiest mm -hmm. you know, method of collecting data. Most agencies uh, have access to their mobile digital computers. A lot of uh, the agencies have officers have smartphones. It's the easiest way for us to do it is to use the web portal. Now, there are some agencies in remote areas and have difficulties with connectivity, et cetera. They may not have the access to do that, and they may have to submit it in one of the other ways uh, prescribed. But in either case, I can think of almost no agency in California that does not have a computer-aided dispatch uh, system, which, which, which allows the agencies to track the calls for service, the stops, everything like that, and to audit whether or not the employees uh, are submitting their reports. It's certainly going to require a little bit of extra work from supervisors mm -hmm. to do that, but it's not any different than anything else that we do relative to our specific orders on those things. So. Uh -huh. And then lastly, the first round of agencies that are going to be submitting data, those are the larger urban agencies and CHP, right? So um, we probably all of those will be web, web portal based? I can speak to this or, or Audra can. Um. So out of the eight agencies, uh, we have one agency that is scheduled to submit via the web application, and then we have five that will either be web services or SFTP, and then we have two agencies that are, that are still determining that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so just a, a couple of quick other notes about as far as how the location information is going to uh, be collected. Um, again, just to, sh to show you some of the features that we're trying to add, uh, once they start typing in a city name, it will start filtering down to help them locate the um, correct city just to try to make sure they can do this quickly. Uh, next, they'll be navigated to enter the segment of data on the uh, perception data. And everything here on the screen follows the regulations. Um, uh, then the, the next segment of data that they enter is for the reason for stop. And this field is going to, or this page rather, is going to be dynamic. Um, based on what the officer selects as the reason for stop, then there's other data that may be applicable. So for this particular example, if uh, the reason for stop is a traffic violation, then the officer needs to record the type of traffic violation and then also indicate the charge that it was related to. Um, so once they select that field, basically the, the page is dynamic, it will refresh, and then they have to also enter those other um, three pieces of required data. So this is going to vary slightly uh, depending on what they select. How do we know that that, that information that he stopped the person is true? He can say, I stopped you for a red light. He stopped you for something totally different. So when they enter the information, just like they do police reports, who would yeah. say is that information correct that they give you? That's his word. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I understand. Yes, sir. I hear you. I hear you. I'm not trying to interrupt. I'm not, I'm not experiencing it that. I hear you. Yes, sir. So, hear you. If, if folks, make sure you write these comments down, because there will be a time for both the sharing of these questions and comments and some time of some Q&A and some answer back with the board. I, I, I feel you. Mm -hmm. So everybody can, you know, you can mm -hmm. think about that. How do we know when they tell us 
you, the police, or you, the DOG, the Department of Justice, the mm -hmm. truth. Because right now, there is no truth with them. Right. Noted. The thing they do, they falsify. They tell right. the media one thing, then they come tell y'all something else. Say and they tell right. the parents say something that. else, mm -hmm. and then they tell the people that died that, oh, they the criminals. How you gonna kill somebody and then everything they do? Oh, he got drugs. He was arrested five years ago. You make everything seem like he's the worst one. Just tell us what happened. I got you. I got you. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Yes, sir. I didn't experience it exactly. Thank you, sir. You this this our meeting, right? This everybody's meeting. Amen. All right. Our meeting. <laughs> I was about to say whose house, but you beat me to it. All right, man. All right go ahead. We, let's go ahead and continue yeah. in. Yeah. In this now, now, wait a minute, now, uh, Mr. Chairman, Co-Chairman, Reverend McBride, if you say whose house, we're going to say it's Compton's house. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought we stopped all that gang banging, but all right. We're going to see straight out of Compton. All right, let's... <laughs> That, let's finish our siege so we can get all of the information so we can appropriately dissect it. All right, can we do that? All right, let's get the rest of the info. Okay. Okay. Th thank you for the feedback. A again, I think these are excellent points for the board to further consider. Um, then the next segment of data, um, well, th this will just kind of uh, show here on this screenshot how the uh, offense codes are going to be selected. Um, through our outreach, we have received a lot of questions about this. Um, so there's a standard table that agencies use when uh, they're sending data to DOJ on arrests, and that's the table that will be available in this system as well. Um, and we're providing some different ways just to try to make sure they can uh, navigate that, because it's it could be a large a large table of a lot of different codes. So we've added some features there to, to try to um, make sure they can capture the, the correct information. Uh, the next screen that they go to is then for actions taken. Uh, they see the, the list of all the different actions taken that need to be recorded pursuant to the regulations. Uh, this screen will also be dynamic. Uh, based on what is selected, then additional information may be required. Uh, so I've highlighted uh, two areas there. Um, and uh, those address the situation that when a person is asked for consent to search, uh, then the officer needs to record whether or not consent was given, yes or no. So the screen will be refreshed to require that they collect that information. Yeah. Um, some other things that will change on uh, depending on what's selected as far as actions taken go. If uh, the officer indicates that a search was conducted, either a search of the person or search of property, uh, then the workflow will be changed where they have to then submit additional information about the, the search. Uh, so um, you'll see up in the uh, upper right, an, a, another page gets introduced to the workflow uh, so that data can be collected. And then similarly, if they indicate that property was seized, uh, then the workflow is changed uh, where they have to report more information about the property that was seized. So another page is introduced to the workflow on that. Um, then the next segment of data that's collected is about whether or not any contraband or evidence was involved. And then uh, last but not least, they have to report information about the result of stop. And then similarly, this page um, is dynamic based on what they select. Uh, additional things may be required. So for example, if they indicate um, that a warning was given, then they have to um, report more information that ties it to what exact offense code that pertains to. Uh, and then I have screenshots in here that show those additional fields that are pages that may or may not apply. So this is the page for search conducted. Uh, then we this is the additional page for when property is seized. Um, we also have a scenario that when um, the officer indicates that the stop occurred at a K through 12 public school, uh, then additional information is required. Uh, they have to identify the school name. Um, so we've given you a list here in our jurisdiction. For example, Sacramento, we have John F. Kennedy High School as a really common name. Once they start typing that in, they'll see additional information to make sure they are putting the correct school associated with that record. And um, then they also have to indicate whether or not the stop involved a student 
at that campus. And then once they do that, um, all of the pages in our workflow will show those additional options that might apply to a K through 12 student. Uh, so the reason for stop will show different options, actions taken, basis for search, basis for property seizure and result of uh, stop have uh, additional <laughs> options that might apply when a student is involved on a K through 12 public school. So we just wanted to make folks aware of that, that um, the, the pages and the workflow process will be tailored depending on the scenario of the stop and what the person selects. Um, and th this is an example of, of some different things for a reason for stop. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions right now about the screens. Or, go ahead. Not really a question, but a comment. Uh, certainly a lot of great work being done by CGIS on, on this. Um, I particularly like the fact that officers are prompted to the additional fields when the check boxes are, are, are done. And that's important, at least for members of the community, to understand that they can't bypass those, so that they have to complete Yes. the additional fields to ensure that the entire report is comprehensive. So great job on that. Um, I, um, I also want to thank you for the report, but I have to indicate that I'm, I find it very difficult to read uh, everything on there. Is it possible to get paper? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> you do have a copy in your oh, blue folder. Oh, I didn't folder. realize that. Is it and there? uh, there's also copies it. of um, anyone in the audience had a problem seeing the screen. Uh, there's copies available uh, that can uh -huh. be distributed to the audience as well. Okay, thank you. Yes. Oh, God, I can't read this. We can get an e-copy sent. Yeah. Can't, we, we can have an electronic copy sent um, for, for those of us who eyes need some bigger font. All right. Thank you, Reverend. Yes, ma'am. I got a couple Where's questions, too. Okay, can I ask you? you can go ahead and move on to the next steps now. Oh, wait, sorry, we have a, one more. I have a couple questions. Uh, the first one is on the, uh, the updating of the system, the autofills, the drop-down boxes. Mm -hmm. how, uh, how often will that be updated with new information? Uh, obviously, uh, penal code changes, uh, vehicle code changes, will that be updated automatically? Um, it, it will be updated as those tables are updated. Uh, basically, at DOJ, we are using the same master table, the, the prime table that we use to track offenses. Um, so it, it also comes from our division, so it will be automatic to the system, too. And then if uh, an officer finds an error or mistake on the, uh, through the process, is there a way to report that directly to DOJ? Yes, absolutely. Um, I didn't necessarily, um, see, you couldn't see it on the screens. I was trying to make them as big as possible. But on the bottom of each screen is our phone number and our email address if they need to contact us about anything. Okay. And uh, can we get an electronic copy of this? Yes. OK. Yes. Um, so. Go ahead. Right. Do you want me to Gotti has a question or comment. I think there's 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 one more. Yeah. We just have a, a few more slides. Um, just to go over. That's okay. Um, I'll do them very quickly to stay on time. Um, our next steps, we will be conducting user acceptance testing with those agencies um, beginning at the end of April. Uh, we will then have train the trainer sessions with all the agencies. Aaron's team, the business team, will be going out to all of the agencies to train on those different submission methods. Uh, we will then do user onboarding simultaneously with that. And then, as you know, data collection begins July 1st. And just to summarize very quickly some of the outreach that we've been conducting um, prior to developing this technology, we have had on-site meetings with Wave 1 and Wave 2 agencies. Um, we have also met with all of the record management systems and CAD vendors for those agencies. Um, let's see. And then since, since the regulations were finalized in November, we have held two regional meetings, one in Sacramento and one in Los Angeles, to go over in detail some of those technical documents that Aaron had mentioned, um, data dictionary, technical specifications, just to try to get those agencies on board as quickly as possible. As you know, um, we've had a very aggressive timeline, timeline to implement all of this technology, uh, so we're just moving very quickly. Um, we will, we actually, Aaron's team has been having weekly meetings uh, with all of the agencies as well on all of the technical um, items that they're working on. 
And then lastly, we will have a meeting in April, um, just a follow-up session on the statute and regulations with the agencies. So again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Adonati. I'm from the uh, Attorney General's office. I just want to say it's so good to see some of the familiar faces that have been coming to these meetings, and I want to welcome those who are new to these meetings and encourage that you continue to come. It's good to see such a good turnout. Um, I did want to just mention and update the board um, on something that Audra just mentioned. Um, Deputy Attorney General Catherine Israel and I, working with Audra, Aaron, and Charles, will be doing our first presentation for law enforcement that goes through and helps them understand the regulations and how to fill out um, a template or whatever template they develop, um, similar to what Aaron had, has been discussing throughout. Um, those are the first and second wave. Now it's going to be a webinar, and um, we're going to be doing that more and more as we more and more agencies come on board. Um, and as, as you all know, the second wave of agencies will start uh, collecting data on January 1st. So the first wave is six six months. They will report in April, and then um, at, and then the second wave will start on January 1st, and they will then report in April 2020. So um, we're progressing along, and and we'll have more and more data as as time goes on. Um, somewhat interesting. I don't know if if you are all interested, but yesterday the Attorney General's office issued two law enforcement bulletins on data collection that is somewhat related um, in, in a way to the issues of this board, and they involve um, the implementation of the California Values Act and the Cal California Truth Act, and then also with respect to the data that law enforcement needs to report if they form joint task forces and whether or not those joint task forces make any arrests, and if they make arrests, how many of those arrestees um, were <coughs> arrested for immigration-related violations. Um, and then there's also another provision where transfers made um, to ICE need to also be reported to the Department of Justice. That's, that requirement to collect that information started on January 1st of this year and will be reported in January um, of 2019, January 15th of 2019 to the Department of Justice. So I just wanted to make you all aware of that. Um, and. And I know we have a Q&A, but I don't want to make you repeat yourself, but I do, I do want to respond and say that the issue that you raised regarding um, data integrity at the officer level, I think it's so important, um, as we did with the regulations, as, as we hope to continue doing as we collect the data, that you um, are really in a good position to help us because you know what what's happening on the ground and and we we re, we want you to continue to be involved with us continue to come to these meetings continue to um you know be active in your communities and and help us keep law enforcement honest in what they are doing so um i want to thank you all and and just encourage you to continue um to be active all right. I want to direct the board's attention. We're, right after this component, we're coming to public comment. Um, so we're not too far uh, off off track unless there's a lot of energy around this next component. Uh, I want to direct the attention of the board to um, the conversation we're having about the 2019 uh, RIPA report and future reports. There's several um, components uh, that we have both were highlighted in the last report and discussion for, for future reports um, around stop data, complaints, state and local policies, post training. For those folks that don't know what POST is, POST is an acronym, stands for Peace Officer Standards and Training. It's a nonprofit organization that is responsible for informing how law enforcement officers are trained in their different agencies, so post training and recruitment, and then also evidence based. 
research and best practices. So just want to open it up for the board before we go to public comment uh, for some for some discussion around uh, things that people want to flag as we're starting off this process this year and thinking about uh, you know what we want to have in that report. Um, if if folks can, if on the board we can uh, have a, some time of discussion around that. Okay. Um, and yeah. I'll just flag, we also have additional time to discuss the components of the 2019 report after public comment. So if you want to do super high level now and then dig into more of the sort of details after public comment, we can do that as well. Super helpful. So if, if folks can maybe flag themes for us and we'll be, we'll be collecting those down for a deeper dive after the break. Okay, I think it's important to note that um, assuming that we do, we are able to generate um, substantial and um, comprehensive and useful data, uh, I think it's important that we understand that the data we do generate can't be analyzed in a vacuum. It's got to be analyzed and compared or within a framework of other st statistics such as um, the percentage of the protected classes within uh, the state of California and the jurisdictions that we're examining. Um, we also have to be able to take note of um, with respect to the school stops, uh, what's going on in that school, the percentage of the protected classes in that school, and how the stats show that they're being treated. In other words, um, the data that we're discussing can't be viewed narrowly. It has to be viewed within that general framework. And I think um, members of the community must agree with that also. I just have one comment. It's not necessarily about the context, it, and it has specifically to do with posts. And I know I've raised this issue a lot. I think we are going to be putting a significant amount of responsibility on posts to implement these practices statewide, uh, training statewide, which are really critically important to the success of what this board wants to do. And as I said before, this board really needs to get behind supporting posts to ensure that they're properly resourced to do that job. Because if we come up with some great ideas some great training, uh, new regulations, but they aren't properly Im Im implemented, the reality is we're not really going to accomplish anything. So I always just remind the board that to the extent we have influence in the governor, the budget, our legislators, to ensure that it, nothing will get done unless it's properly resourced. We all know that. It's a lot of words, a lot of energy, but finally, at the end of the day, the officers need to receive the training. We need to update our policies in order to, for those things that we want to happen become a reality. Without hearing any further comments from board members, we're going to begin. Oh, I'm sorry. Square. Yes, thank you. Yes, so I want to acknowledge that all of the things that we're doing is really driving at transparency and accountability in law enforcement. And the reason why that matters is that law enforcement is the only profession where we give its practitioners the power to carry a gun and take life, liberty, and property, right? That's extraordinary power, and we need to make sure that that power is accountable at all times. And so, so this, the stop date is going to be a really important component of that, right? And it's, but it's not the only one. And although there is a delay in getting the stop data because we're just now onlining everything, and, and thank you to CIGIS and to Department of Justice for moving quickly to get all that done, there's a lot that we can do in 2019 to, to press forward on the issues of transparency and accountability. We can, um, we can look more closely at, at these other issues, complaints, uh, policies, uh, training, and uh, best practices. And so I look forward to us doing that deeper dive because um, you know, there are a lot of components to increasing accountability. And I think, uh, you know, having spent the last few months in Washington, D.C., working on, uh, on, on federal issues, I can tell you that a lot of people are watching what California does and see if we can get it right and we can really set the standard for other parts of the country. Yeah. And just, oh. It's 
on. I think just start talking. Is it on? Okay. So I would just add in the school context, I think it's really important. Um, yeah, I think you just turned it off. Okay. Turn it on now. Um, in the school context, too, I think it's really important, um, as, as the judge mentioned, to uh, analyze school discipline data, especially because um, the administration's revoked a lot of the guidelines on school discipline um, that uh, had uh, had schools taking a look on, at disproportionate impact on students of color. So I think it's a good opportunity for um, for that data and the school context to be analyzed against discipline numbers. Um, and there's also a whole, you know, this data is for sworn officers. But there's a lot of other types of school, security patrol in the school context. So I think analyzing that as well, and to, especially for the districts that potentially have the highest numbers of stops, would be really important. Because I think schools are a whole another um, area where, where uh, people of color are being criminalized. And there's a lot of different considerations there. Thank you. Any other comments from the board members? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me just say this. I think the, the collection of data has limitations. In other words, you cannot, there's nothing in, the, in this data collection that's going to make an officer tell the truth. I mean, <clears throat> they're either going to tell the truth or they're going to lie. But in those situations, it's up to the public if if there's a situation where an officer gives a version of an event that is not the same as the individual saw it, then they need to also give their report, either through internal affairs or you know making their making making it known that they disagree with the assessment of the officer. So this data collection is a tool, but it's not a panacea to everything. What do we want? Mr. Bobro, a comment? Yeah, um, a couple of comments. One, uh, this is our tailing off of that. Is I don't think it's on. They'll turn it's it on if it's they, up. They, they, they'll, they'll turn it up. up. They'll turn it up. Just. So just dovetailing off of that, um, I mean, this is going to require legislation, but I think um, based on what happened in Sacramento to Mr. Clark, um, and what happened on that video uh, of the officers turning off the mic. Um, I mean, it isn't mandated currently that all officers have cameras. Um, they're, in, in fact, all departments don't even have cameras. Uh, but if there were legislation and if this board recommended legislation based on our experiences, based on what we've been seeing, throughout the state and the country that all departments are required to have cameras. Those cameras must go on when an officer is involved in investigation, when they're out of their car, when, when they're in their car. Um, but that if there would be some kind of uh, disciplinary process if a, if a uh, camera wasn't turned on during a, an event where a weapon were, was discharged. Uh, just an automatic disciplinary uh, <clears throat> process, and and that those cameras are web-based, downloaded into a server that cannot be altered, and that the and that the sound it cannot be turned off. Um, that we take out the uh, what everybody seems to be concerned about, and I know I am concerned about about the ability of of an officer to input the data themselves versus the uh, the technology to require that data to be inputted uh, independent of the officer. So that's something I think we need to, to talk about. And then I, I also was looking at the, the list of um, additional discussion items for 2019 and use of force. And Reverend McBride, I was thinking about what you said at the outset and the list of names of people that have been killed. We don't have that list in our report. Um, we should, when we develop future reports, I think begin with um, a, a, some kind of tribute to or, or remembrance of the lives that have been taken 
um, by law enforcement and, and list those people and the circumstances and the dates in the state of California, at least we're a California agency, um, and to have that be part of our report and, and the focus of, of our report. So those were the additional comments I had. Mr. Ali. Uh, thank you, Chief. <clears throat> Makai Ali, and I serve as a member of the, actually president of the Compton Unified School District Board of Trustees. I'm very grateful that you guys are here today and welcome you to the city of Compton. Ms. Guerrero, you made a very good point, as well as Chief Madrano, you referenced the fact of, of training and, and you referenced the fact of this job being one that you take someone at a very young age with very limited education, very limited education, not a four-year degree, not a two-year degree, high school diploma. You send them through training. You hand them a gun. In, in some instances, they'll go to the county jail if they're L.A. County Sheriff, and they'll do their training there. They're LAPD, they'll hit the streets. There's been a tremendous debate since the 1960s with respect to increasing education levels needed within law enforcement. And the chief, you hit the nail on the head. There has to be a push from this board to ensure that POST receives the necessary uh, budgetary appropriations to ensure that officers are trained. But I go a step further. And we have to advocate, not just as this board, but when we go back to our respective organizations, whether it be social and civil justice, law, there's a couple of judges sitting up here, associations, POLRAC, on down the line. We, are, we ought to advocate that law enforcement folk have increased collegiate education. If a school teacher is required to have a bachelor's degree, and in many instances, if tradesmen are required to have advanced education, nurses continual education, that needs to occur at, within the law enforcement ranks. And, and ma'am, 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 folks, hold on one second, okay? Give me an opportunity to, to, to say my say. Okay, we're all together here. We're all together. We, we know what it is required. No peace! No peace! No peace! Well, I'm not a police. I'm from Compton. I'm on a school board. <laughs> hey, I'm with you, okay? I'm with you. I'm with you 100%. The fact of the matter is this, folks. We, within our, within our existence as a board, we have to make sure that we're advocating for various laws and that we appropriate dollars to ensure that there's adequate training and then we're able to hold folk accountable. That's one particular aspect. It's one particular aspect of this body. So I would hope that we would take the chief's uh, recommendation and perhaps work collaboratively to join a, to draft a joint letter that we would then send over to Assemblywoman Shirley Weber and see if there are some ways in which we can increase appropriations. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ali. We're now gonna go ahead and move to the public comment period. Just a couple uh, rules. If we usually allow only three minutes. I will be holding up the one minute card. I understand if you're right in the middle of a thought, uh, please just finish that thought and try to give um, courtesy to the many people who want to speak. It's important that we hear from all of them. If you have a specific question, we will be taking those questions down. I hope someone from DOJ will be writing them down. And then we will respond to them as a board. Uh, we're not going to be responding back and forth with the questions because that will not allow for enough time in our schedule. So please, uh, each speaker, limit your comments to three minutes. When you he hear this, put this up. Try to, try to end your thoughts as quickly as possible. We even have nicer ones. OK. <laughs> Thank you very much. I guess look over there with the nice ones that are color coded. Uh, first speaker, please. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Lori Valdez, and I'm from um, San Jose, California. And I'm here, I want to say thank you for implementing this board, first of all. Me, myself, 
because I know a few people on there, I'm kind of hopeful, but I'm really not confident that any change of significant matter will impact the lives of the children left behind, left fatherless. I want you guys to take a look. We talk about California is the deadliest state, okay? Children are traumatized from these police killings. These are children, and I, I want each of you to see it, so I'm going to ask somebody to take that so you guys can see the faces, okay? These children are not invisible. They're very much alive and here, and yet nobody ever addresses it because it's too political. When is it too political to ignore children suffering the trauma and the aftermath and nobody addressing it? Do you guys know, do any of you know that trauma, what trauma does to a child? Do any of you know that in California, none of our teachers are trauma-informed taught, so therefore a child like my son Josiah up here gets upset or acts out because of the trauma and he does get angry, he's hurt, whatever. They will punish him for hurting instead of helping him, therefore making him a statistic. That's not happening. We need to stop focusing on protecting adult grown men and people who already should know right or wrong. They're not capable of doing the right thing. They are bad role models for our children. We need to focus on the ones left behind. These are little people who have to live in fear the rest of their lives because an officer claimed he acted in fear. There's no reason why a man should be acting in fear if he knows his community. Killing people is not the way to go and not, and as far as my, my case, four years ago, I was forced into this nightmare of a hell. I've been living, seeing my children suffer, especially my son, without any kind of help. We don't get counseling. We don't get help for anything. We're ignored, and I'm tired of being ignored. My son and my daughter and all these little children they should be legislation needs to push to protect the children because they're the ones that are our future leaders and they're the ones that are going to end up broken people who are going to resent police officers and want to become the police officers with that badge so they could go around killing people i don't want that for my son and i'm asking all of you to look into the case of antonio guzman lopez and tell me why four years later nobody is concerned the fact that they've never released the videos or any information on our case. Yet my son is suffering. Why? What is the cover-up? Why not? My children are never going to heal because we don't know what happened that day. And it is a responsibility of every adult here that they have to protect our children first. Children come before adults all the time. This village needs to protect them. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. <clears throat> this mic on? Okay. Uh, I'm going to go right off script right before I start and just say we are at a state of emergency. And as Laurie spoke, we are clear that this is not even about us. It is about these children, these grandbabies, and these great grandbabies that are coming behind us. So if we really want a sincere, right society, we must address this issue today. So I'm standing here in hopes that I'm appealing to some hearts. Because most times when we stand before boards, the individuals are heartless. Yes. And as we pour out our emotions, yes. right, it seems to fall on deaf ears. And there's a lot of pain, as you said, yes, Pastor McBride, in this room today. So you're going to hear some stories that we're hoping that you hear and from your heart really do the work to make this place right and hold police officers accountable. Now. I can go on script. Good morning, and thanks to you for being here today. I am the uncle of Oscar Grant, Cephas Johnson, affectionately known to the community as Uncle Bobby, to Oscar, to families, to many families around the world, it even across seas, uh, and to the community. Oscar was murdered on January 1st, 2009 by Bar Police Officer Johannes Mesley at the Fruitville Bark Station in Oakland, California, where many in the community witnessed the murder and video recorded what they saw. Because of the videos, because of the rebellion, and because of the Longshoreman Union, IOW, 
ILWU, Local 10 Union, shutting down the Northern California ports, we got for the first time in California state history an officer arrested, charged, convicted, and sent to jail. Okay. So, um, we don't count it as a victory, we count it as history. Because we're clear, since Oscar murder, 1,100 people on an average is murdered every year. Every year. So all we can say is that what it did was give a tick mark of a historical moment of something that happened in time. But the issue truly needs to be addressed. So I want to, with great appreciation, thank the families that are here today. I want to especially say thank you to the families traveling from Northern California. This is an important occasion today. Sadly for us families that has seen another unjust murder of another loved one, which always reopened the pain of that loss that we suffered, um, brings to remembrance of why we are here and how important our fight is for justice. Today is all about strengthening and building trust between our communities and men and women of law enforcement. In other words, accountability and transparency. Many various bills have been introduced to strengthen, the, to strengthen and build this trust, such bill as AB 953. Of course, AB 619 was held in appropriations. AB 71, Camilla Harris, uh, was she championed, basically. And we could go on with the bills. But the question is, are these legislations working? And it appears that they're not when we look at the numbers of bodies that are being killed across just the state of California and across this nation. So we are presently here today for AB 953, the Racial Identity Profiling Act of 2015, which aims to curb the harmful and unjust practice of racial and identity profiling and increase transparency and accountability with law enforcement agency. It is my position that AB 71 use of force incident reporting includes racial identity profiling data that has led to the murder of Stephen Clark, no firearm, Shalene Tindo, yeah. no firearm, yeah. Oscar Grant, yeah. no firearm, and so many others, no firearms. Loved ones murdered because an officer perceived these loved ones had a firearm. That's why we're here. This perception is murdering our children, murdering our babies. We gotta address the perception. According to AB 71, data reported to the Department of Justice from January 1st, 2016 to January 1st, 2017, in the reporting of the Open Justice website for the first year of 2016, racial profiling murders is clear in this data. So I'm hoping you're looking at AB 71 and the data it collects and to incorporate this profiling stop and what leads to murder. Okay, now check. Now, just check this out. There were 782 incidents reported that involved use of force that resulted in serious bodily injury, death of a civilian or an officer, or the discharge of a firearm. Of the 782 incidents, 270 were perceived to be armed with a firearm. Out of that 270 perceived, 257 civilians were shot by police that did not even have a firearm, and 75 civilians were missed. Only 183 were confirmed to have a firearm. So really, the total is 322, 332 were perceived, 257 were shot, and only 183 were confirmed to have a firearm. But that's telling me I got a 50-50 chance to survive a police stop. A 50-50 chance. Now, we can do the numbers to see what the real percent is, but what we're saying is that the percent is so high that no wonder folks run. You hear what I'm saying? No wonder black men run. Because we're scared every time a police officer stop us. Now, if we investigate this data of officer reason for the use of force, we would find that of the 1,209 use of force taken into custody, what percentage would be black? What percentage would be white, Hispanic, Asian, or native? And of the 257 times officers fired 
and hit a civilian, what would the data tell us about the racial makeup of those individuals that pulled that gun or fired that shot? Sir, can you wrap it up? Closing. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm closing. Our house. Thank you. And it brought me to my question that actually ends this, so thank you. Thank you. Will the board review the data in AB 71 that is connected directly to racial profiling and why we're here? We're talking about murders. Right. The stops are important, but behind those stops, an individual have a 50-50 chance of surviving that stop. That is way too high. So we are appealing to your hearts. We have always said that appealing to your hearts on these boards is useless. But I'm in hope, I'm optimistic, that you truly will hear what we're saying and sharing our pain and how critical this data is so that we can make sure that our babies have a right to life. Thank you. Thank you. Just as, as, our, as our next speaker comes up, we just want to encourage everyone, please, as much as you can, if we can stick to three minutes, there's a really long line. I don't even think I can see the end of it. Where's the end of the line? No, the, the end of the line. Oh, okay. Okay. So, all right. So if, if everyone can please, two to three minutes, two to three minutes so that we can get everyone's comment in. We've got a break coming up uh, shortly. So, uh, is it? So, all right, so two to three minutes, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you. Um, my name is Teresa Smith. I'm the mother of Cesar Cruz. And this is important to me because my son was killed by five Anaheim police officers. He was shot in the back 15 times while he was still strapped in his seatbelt. And all because of a traffic stop. So this is very, very important to me. And I'm hoping that on this report that they're going to be put that in their report when they do a stop, that they have taken someone's life, because I don't see anything about that up there. No, no, no. Right. And that's important, because there's been many, many who have been killed due to a traffic stop, a light. Um, the story for my son is that he got off his car, um, which he couldn't have done because his um, door was broken, so he had to re go out the window or go out the passenger side. But they said he got out of his car, reached in his waistband, which is one of their stories that they always say, with his right hand. Little did they know that my son was left-handed. <clears throat> so <clears throat> he got out, they said. Uh, they feared for their life because he reached in his waistband. They shot him 15 times. And that he got back in his car, still strapped in his seatbelt, because they had to cut, this, cut him out of his seatbelt to get him out of the car. All the bullets were from behind, so there's no way my son was looking at him. My son died with his hands clenched, and that was because he was holding onto the steering wheel. He had the marks of the handcuffs on him. The worst part of it is that they sent me to the hospital telling me that he was still alive when he was dead. Made me wait for three hours before they would tell me that my son wasn't dead. They said he expired. Um, the district attorney did not even tell me that he justified the killing. I had to find out from a journalist. So when we talk about trauma, my son left behind five boys that are now growing up without their father. Um, so Lori's right. There is no trauma. The victim witness refused us any kind of help because it was my son's fault he got killed. So there's a lot of issues, but I'm hoping that, you know, with this bill and with others to come, hopefully, that you'll finally, finally, people will realize that there's a lot more to, to what happens than just the killing. It's the trauma. The trauma that we face for, for mothers, for wives, for children, for cousins, for uncles, for aunts, for the community. You know, everything becomes a hot topic. You know, like right now, it's a Stephen Clark. You know, I don't know who it's going to be next month. There's a flavor of the month every month. You know, that's what we become, a flavor of the month. You know, we become statistics. I'm sorry, but my son was a human being. You need to realize the lives that were taken 
We're human beings. They're not statistics. So I just hope that, I mean, this is just a part of what we really want. And justice, for me, personally, will never happen because you're not going to give me my son's life back. What you're going to give me is accountability and transparency. So thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Darling Atkins, and my son is, um, he attends Compton Unified School District. I sat at the board meeting last night with President um, Ali, and I want to use your words that you just said. I reported to you that my son was bullied by his teacher, and he walked out of his class in emotional distress. And according to your words that you just used up here, he walked out and possibly into the hands of someone who's not properly trained and who do not have the education to handle what he was feeling at that point. His teacher called him racial slurs, used hateful words, used a word that was considered, according to the student handbook of the Compton USD, is a sexual harassment. And the district is not properly handling my son's claim. You guys are sending me information about my son that is inaccurate. You guys are sending out false reports. I came here on today, I did not know about this meeting. I came here today to file eight complaints against the Compton USD. It just so happens I see some young men outside and they were saying, oh, we standing up for the police. I said, what? And I thought about it, sitting here listening to all these parents. My son could have been a victim that day. He could have walked out of that classroom in emotional distress into the hands of someone who was not equipped to deal with the situation at hand. So the comp you guys failed my son, not only because he was harassed and bullied by his teacher on multiple occasions. My son went to a Spanish teacher and told her, hey, this is what's going on. It was no report of that. I received a call from my son's teacher saying, hey, you know what? Your son is suspended from my classroom. I said, okay, why? He didn't tell me why. My son told me why. You know what? Because he was sitting up there calling me names, mom. And in order for me not to respond, I had to walk out. And when my son walked out, no one called me. No one told me, hey, you know what? Your son is in emotional distress. Your son can go home and possibly kill himself. Your son can walk out there and do something to someone else's kid. During the Parkland shootings, what did they say? That young man was in uh, mental, his mental health. You guys not only put my son at risk, but you put the risk of everybody that was at Centennial High School that day. I'm asking you to take your words and be a man and utilize them when you're making a decision on my son's claim at the board meeting where I said at 12 o'clock at night, after 12, got back up, went to a meeting at, the, at my son's school where his principal is retaliating against him and not allowing him to go to school, not allowing my son and me to meet with his teacher and the counselor at the same time together per the student handbook, per my request. You see what I'm saying? You guys are not allowing these things to happen. When I went up to the school today, you guys told the teacher and the principal not to talk to me and write down questions and email it. Well, why did we have this meeting today? My son been out for five days, not able to go to school. My son ranked number two at his school, number two out of over 200 and some students. My son had a 4.2 GPA before he was harassed and bullied by his teacher. Now my son do not acquire that type of GPA. He's not allowed. He's not allowed to pick the college he want to go to. He has to be, he has to take a letter that's sent to him. He can't make that choice. He can't be at Harvard like everybody's um, um, kids up here. Can you please wrap up? He can't up your make comments. that decision. I'm, I'm gonna wrap up. I'm gonna wrap it up. Thank you. But I want you to know that these police officers, if, if my son is in emotional distress, how are they gonna handle him? Yeah. In Beverly Hills, you gotta have a bachelor's degree in order to be a part of the police department. The police department is the highest paid department in the city. So when a young lady stated that, I was like, wow. People are passionate. Enough. Not only am I passionate about this, but others are too. So do the right thing as the president of the Compton Unified School District Board. Thank you.
hello everybody i just want to thank everyone and my god first for allowing me to be here to speak my truth um, my name is Kimberly Phillips. I'm here on uh, from Silicon Del Valley Debug on behalf of my dead son, Aaron James Phillips, also known as AJ. On August 15, August 10, 2015, there was a call for help at my house. The police um, showed up because my son was threatening suicide. Um, I was their first point of contact, despite the lies that they told in the press release. Um, I yes, there's several lies here. And I'm gonna try to get it before the three minutes because I never had the opportunity to speak the truth as, as being a witness. When those officers arrived, um, they were nowhere near the front of my house. They parked next to my neighbor's house. They automatically took their weapons out and I saw that. So I tried to approach them and I was told to stop. And I, I was begging them, please don't kill my son. Please don't kill my son, he needs help. Not even seconds later, I hear my son come out. I can't see him and all he says is what? You know, and the next thing you know, they say, put your hands up, put your hands up, put your hands up, and then the bullets go off right past my face as I'm screaming, bloody murder. When they stopped, I tried to run to him, and I was ordered to the ground at gunpoint. The only reason I stopped is because my daughter behind me said, Mom, Mom, she didn't want me to get shot. So I said, oh my God, did you just kill my son? You know what the officer's response was? I don't know, ma'am. I can't see. I don't know, ma'am. I can't see. So later we were taken away. And when we were taken away, they knew my baby was dead. But they didn't tell me he was dead. They lied and said that he ran back in the house and they never shot him. And he shot himself. And let me tell you something. God is not allowing that because my God done showed me the truth. There is blood spatter all outside the windows of my house. There was blood spatter on the cement. There's blood spatter on my screen door and it bleeds to this day and I refuse to wash it off. Because that's his truth. I gave them access to my digital camera. I got four hours missing data. Yeah. Never had four hours missing data since August 10th, 2015. Yeah. Yeah. I have filed complaints with internal affairs. None of this exists to them that they acted within protocol. Okay? Now, if you didn't shoot my son, why do I got four hours missing data? They say they never touched my camera. I had forensics. I spent thousands of dollars to find out proof that they did, and I submitted all this. I showed them to the face they lie, and what do they do? They acted within policy. So I'm here to tell you, I even filed a department with the Department of Justice. I get letters back, I'm sorry, ma'am, your son killed himself. I said, what about the blood? What about my four hours missing data? What about the projectile y'all say you have, I found? What about the injuries to his legs you never told me about? Why didn't, I want you to picture this. When I fought so hard to get that police report, I fought hard. Yeah. When I fought so hard to get his autopsy, I was told by Officer Rosa Vega he had one injury to his head, nothing else. I find out he has injuries to the leg, defects on his pants. I was told a dog came in the house, and that's what those are, postmortem um, dog bites. I'm telling you, no, that's gunshot wounds. And let me tell you something. Picture this, my baby dead with his eyes wide open, pants down, laying there wide away while they're cleaning up. And I want to ask you, if this, the, this is what the police officer's bill of rights does. It allows them to commit murder and clean it up because there's no accountability. I want to know, if they, was they acting in, in, within policy while they're on their hands and knees cleaning up my son's blood? Yeah. Deleting footage? That's right. Pushing my camera up? Come on now. And if I file complaints with IA, IPA, everywhere, and no one's done nothing for me or my family, where does one go? Y'all sending me the wrong message. Okay, that's why we need to dismantle the officer's bill of rights, because this allows them to kill people and, then, and, and lie and say it's a suicide. This is corruption at its finest. And when the Department of Justice, I got a restraining order from the FBI even. Okay? The FBI won't even help me. Nobody. 
So remember my son's name and remember my face, Aaron James Phillips, AJ. I am Aaron James Phillips. So there you go. Y'all murdered my baby. My name is Dina Abello. I'm the wife of James Nate Greer. We were together for 25 years, and he was killed by Hayward and Bart police on May 23rd, 2014. There was over 20 officers there. It's caught on video, and he was pulled over for what the lieutenant said was driving goofy. So I see that you guys are doing this little form. The police are going to go and put their little data in there and stuff like that. This is what I call due diligence. You guys are doing this to suffice what you think that we want to hear. I want, I want to be able to access that data. Let me go online and pull it up. I don't want the addresses. I don't care where they live. I don't want to know anything like that. Put on there that this was a stop. Why? Because he was driving goofy? The 911 call says black male driving. Didn't say nothing about driving goofy. My husband was Latino. Where does it say on there that he, he ends up in a death? You guys want us to call the independent investigators. The district attorney hires somebody. You got IA. This is, this is a conflict of interest. I don't trust those people. They're on the paycheck. They're getting paid. I would not trust them to do it. They've done investigations, and they continue to do investigations. They did with my husband. And in Alameda County, during the time when my husband was killed, he wasn't shot. He was tased. He was choked. He was beaten. He was tased multiple times at the same time by a lieutenant who knows better in the face choked, his head was stomped on, a baton was shoved under his throat while his head was being stepped on, and seven officers sat on his body while they choked him. They said he's turning blue, he's not breathing. They sat there and they watched him die. It's on video. They didn't know that they were being videotaped because BART police had the body camera, not Hayward. When Hayward police walked up to the BART officer, he said, are you, are you recording? The officer said, no, I'm not. And he said, you're flashing red. He says, oh, I've been, ha this is having problems with, all day. And he said, cut it off. And he went, shh. Two other videos pop up. Bart officers also had these videos on. They are on the other side, and they're saying, his lips are blue. They said, let's see what kind of mood he's in. Put a mood ring on him. I bet you it turns black. They knew he was dying. I watched my husband take his last three breaths. They stood there and watched him take his last three breaths while they made jokes, and they made fun of him. They didn't check his pulse. See, the fire department and the ambulance was right there, ready to go. They wouldn't let him on the scene. They waited for him to die before the ambulance was allowed and the fire department was allowed to come. No one checked his pulse. The BART officer that pulled him down, who initiated his death, had CPR training the day before. Did nothing, absolutely nothing. So this little thing, if you can make it public record, people can access it, Do put on there where if it, if it does say there's an in-custody death, it's flagged so that someone can in, do an investigation, not from the district attorney's office, <coughs> someone else, someone that we can trust. Then you'll build trust with the community, then you get your transparency, and then maybe we can talk eye to eye. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sandy Sanchez. Sorry, I'm very emotional. I'm the mother of Anthony Nunez. He was 18. There's a picture of my son. If everybody could please take a look at his picture. He was only 18 years old. On 4th of July, 2016, I received a call. I was out of town that, that they heard gun uh, a shot at my house or something, and our house was surrounded by police. and. And um, I didn't know what happened, and then we get a call later, about 30 minutes into it, that they shot and killed my son. He had a self-inflicted wound. When I left out of town, my son was happy, healthy, you know, had everything going for him. He was more, he got his first job, bought his first car. Like, you know, he was 18, he told me, I'm a man now, ma. I'm gonna do things right. And I was proud of him because he was so, so naive. It's like he got his first bank card and he went to Burger King to go. And um, this is how naive he went to Burger King. And he said, Ma, he called me on himself. I said, yeah. He says, I went to Burger King and I gave him my card and they gave it back to me with the receipt. And he goes, when do I pay? I said, you already paid, huh? Oh, that's sick. That's cool. Like, he, that, he was so, you know, full of life, excited about his life. What happened? On 
on that day, I'll never know. I'll, because I left my son happy and healthy. Next thing you know, I get a phone call. There was a self-inflicted wound to his head. He had shot himself in my room, in my house. And when my nephew got to the house, he found him. Um, the, he made a call to 911. 911 operator told him to place a, get, where's the gun? The gun's next to him. Get the gun away from him, put it in the backyard. That's exactly what my nephew did. Remove the weapon. He said, but my son was passed out, like he fainted from the gun, the, the wound. Right. And then he had gotten up. By the time my nephew came back to where my nephew was at, um, where my son was at, um, you know, he had passed out again. He had fought, gotten up from my room, it went to the hallway, passed out again. And from there, um, you, uh, my nephew said the police, you know, told him to come outside. He was on the phone when two calls were made for help. Two calls. He had, when he shot him, that was just a graze. All they had to do was, ambulance showed up, they told him to leave. All they had to do was help him. He wasn't a bad, he wasn't a bad person. He didn't use weapons. He was not a, a that type of person. And they took his life like it was nothing. I heard that after the cops, my nephew that had found him, they put him in handcuffs, put him in the back of a police car. The cops high-fived each other. The two shooters and shot him and as, there's video that actually actually shows different than what the cops said and it proves that everything they said they lied my son died on the way to the hospital this is one of the things when he got to the hospital he was dead my son was killed at 4 51 p.m on 4th of july 2016 and his body they left his body in front of my house till two o'clock in the morning. Why do they do that? Why, why leave my son's body out? All my neighbors could see it. All my neighbors were telling us, Sandy, your son never had a gun. They shot him in cold blood. You know, get an attorney, do something because they killed him in cold blood. This is a problem. I mean, they, they, please help us. I mean, how can cops be so perfect? How can they not do wrong? Why keep covering up? If you made a mistake, own up to it. If I take a red light, if I, if I, you know, if I take a red light, I still, I gotta go to court for that or I get arrested. I have to own up to my actions for my mistakes. Why are these police officers getting away with murder every single day and nobody's doing anything? Even there's no such thing as a good cop. Because if there's a good cop, then that good cop should say something to the bad cop that's doing wrong, that's arresting somebody or harassing somebody. But it doesn't happen. They cover their own asses. They don't care about our families. They don't care. And I mean, please, you know, support our families. There's so many of us, and it's happening every day. We don't want our group to grow anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. My name is Rosie Chavez. My nephew is Jacob Dominguez from San Jose, California. He was executed, and I will say executed, on September 15th, 2017. This is all new to me, and this is disgusting to see so many lives gone. What made these police officers, the judge, the juror, and the executioner, yeah. what made them take somebody's life without getting prosecution if they were supposedly suspects? They had the right, their civil rights were violated and taken from them. They should have been in. My nephew was on his way home to his kids. Did he struggle? Yes, he did, like everybody else does. He was on his way home. He had just left a program because he struggled with addiction. Yes, he did. I ain't afraid to say that. But you know what? He was a human being. That's right. That's right. He was a human being. That's right. And for them to follow him, who is this covert response unit? What the heck is that? A task force that's just gonna take people out and not, not even arrest them? They followed him. They said they had him surveillance. They said this. They said he was driving erratically within traffic, six o'clock in the evening. <clears throat> How risky is that for the community? No lights, unmarked cars. They swarmed in on him. Brake lights were still on. He wasn't going anywhere. He had a broken leg if they were surveillancing him for so long, he couldn't run. He was in his seatbelt, in 
a car with tinted windows, okay? But they want to put on the media, he's a known gang member. He has not been committed of any crimes or any prison terms since 2004, but that does not give them the right to take his life. He had three babies still to raise, a wife in nursing school, and I praise her for straight A's, and she's still going. But you know what? She's missing her husband and them babies. And my sister is missing her son, her only son. They say we're not in crisis. What about you telling that to those babies when they're going through their trauma? Where's my daddy? I want my daddy home. We are in crisis. This is one too many. This is too much. This got to stop. This is new to me. You know, my sister can't do it. His wife can't do it. They're full of anger. They're full of hate. I have to suppress my grieving to be here and be his voice, his only sister. You know how much this hurts? But I'm going to do it because his name's going to live. And them babies, they have to be a part of that community. How are they going to grow up to hate the cops? How are they going to grow up? You just made them a statistic. No more. No more. Can't stop, won't stop. Yeah. Jacob Dominguez. Jacob Dominguez. Thank you. Haki Kawa Shali. Haki Kawa Mukuk Shali. Haki Kawa Shali. Haki Kawa Mukuk Shali. My name is Yolanda Banks Reed. I'm the mother of Shalim Oshai Tindo that was murdered. January the 3rd, 2018, West Oakland, BART Station, by Officer Joseph Matu, ran out of the BART Station. Hand, gun drawn, where, where, where? So to speak, where's the action? He see my son in a scuffle with another person. They're fighting, they're struggling. The officer run towards him, hands up, hands up, hands up. Shoot him in the back three times while he raising unarmed hands. As he went down to the floor, he still said, hands up. He had already been shot three times. Yes. His hands were still going up. Yes, they were. You know, when I look in here and... I'm trying to identify each of you and where's your minds. What type of mind is it highly human? See, my son is gone now, but his spirit is still alive. Yes, it is. But when I look to the left and I look to the right and I look straight forward and I see your emblem for the Attorney General, she's blind. Yes, she is. She's blind. You say that there's weight, there's balance, but there's not. You accuse and you excuse. Yeah. You talk about transparency. None. Where is it? Where is it? Yes. I don't see it. We don't see it. We they don't, don't see it. it. And you don't see it yourself. No. Life tragically taken. Every day it continues to happen. You know, each of you have been giving unmerited favor, grace, hope, justice, and faith. Each of those are girl-given names. That femininity principle that carried life and life more abundantly. Yeah. That carried life in her womb. Yes. She nurtured, she breastfeeds, she have gave birth to each of you. Yes. And she is disrespected every day when her children are murdered. Yes. You tell me it's a better life, he's in a better place. What better place for him to be? Yes. It's with his children, his ch children that he leaves behind. Yes. His mother, his family, his Hebrew yes. culture community. Yes. You know, when I look at each of you, they say church and state is separate. Mm -hmm. They say faith without works are dead. Yes. And you can show me the data all day long. And if it's good, we will see the results. Yes. If not, we will see the results. Yes. You talk about police reform. If the heart is not reformed, yes. as I say, the heart is terribly wicked, but who can know it? Yes. Yahweh Elohim, yes. some commonly say God. Come on. Yes. 
They can know it. You can know it because you can see their actions and their deeds. When life is taken, life is continued to be taken. What are you going to do about it? I doubt anything. Yes. But it's up to the people. Yes. It's up to the people to do something about it for their children. Yes. How long do you think we're going to continue to take it? Yes. We being the original Hebrews. See, we don't accuse and excuse. No. As they say with the Jews and the Gentiles, they accuse and they excuse all day long. And we see it happening in the judicial system. Nancy O'Malley, we have an appointment April the 2nd yes. to go see Nancy O'Malley. Yes. And we're going to go in and we're going to talk to her and ask her, are you going to hold this police and the police accountable? Or are we going to see transparency? Right. You know, because each of you are judged right now. Yes. And that boy, I say a boy, because a mature man and a mature Yes. Policeman would assess the situation yes. before shooting and killing yes. my son. Yes. And it happened over and over again. But he's already been judged. He's yes. been judged and he's been convicted in my heart and my soul. Yes. He's already been judged. Yes. Yes. Now I'm waiting for the earthly people yes. to do their part. Yes. Can you please wrap up your comments? Their due diligence. I thank Yahweh Elohim for giving my son life and life more abundantly. Yeah. And each of you mothers that have given birth to your children, yeah. that you have breastfed, that you have nurtured. Yeah. The mother, mother soul cell yeah. fundamental principle. Yeah. Mothers fight back. Yeah. It's so yeah. and it is done. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Afia Chambers, the cousin of Shalim Tindall, the mother that just spoke. And the first thing I just want to say is that, you know, I see you represent the Department of Justice, DOJ. Well, DOJ to me stands for Department of Justification. Because all you do is justify these murders, justify these homicides, and you're not doing your part to give justice. See, to justify a fault only doubles it. And it's justified for someone to shoot someone in the back three times? Well, where we come from, anything you do behind the back is considered cowardly. It's considered a coward not to go face to face with a person who you're coming up against. I see you sitting here on the board, but you look bored. Why is the board becoming bored? You should not become bored of all these lives being taken. It's time for you to stand up. You voluntarily go and run for board. On your own, oh, I want to help. I want to give justice. Well, where is it? Where's the justice for our people? Where's the equality for our people? Shalim Tindo, only 28 years old, won't get to raise his son and his daughter. And they don't want to do anything about it? Well, we don't look to you to do anything about it. We're standing to do something about it. We're going to continue to seek justice. We say, Haki Kawa Shalim. Haki Kawa Muku Shalim, which means justice for Shalim Tindo. Justice for Prince Shalim Tindo. Yes. Our boys and girls are royalty. Yes. They are prince and princesses, yes. and they don't deserve to have their life taken when nobody held accountable. Yes. If I was to take somebody's life, you would hold me accountable immediately. Right. But you hide behind, oh, investigation. Yes. What is there to investigate when you clearly see that the lives are being taken? Yes. What else is there to look at? Your heart. That's what it's time to look at. As she holds up the cards, time's up. Well, it's time is up for you. Time is up for each of you if you sit on the board and don't give justice. If you sit on the board and don't give equality. Time's up for you. How can you ask these parents to sum up their children's life in three minutes? But we got to sit here and listen to you for hours about saying data. We don't care about the data. We care about the convictions. It's time for you to process convictions, yeah. not data, because data can easily be tampered with. But conviction, they would have to sit there and think about the life that they have taken behind bars, the same way they put us behind bars when we do things that are minute or trivial and less than taking a life. 
shit. I've seen people that took a candy bar and got they was on a third strike and they got life right now. Yeah. But they get to walk around and know they took somebody's life and it's okay. Oh, no. And then you want us to con condense our stories right. about our children, about our loved ones. Okay. It's gonna take more than three minutes. Right. Just like it's taking you three years to investigate. Right. Four years to investigate. Right. Ten years to investigate. Some people never get answers. And you want us to say in three minutes about the life of our loved one. Yes. Such a mess. No 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 Haki Kawa Shalim. Haki Kawa Muku Shalim. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Aaron Foster. I'm from Compton. I've been here my whole life. But I have a question for the department. Sir, can you speak up just a little bit? My name is Aaron Foster. I'm from Compton. I was born and raised in Compton. I have a question for the Department of Justice, and it was, can the officers go in and edit the reports after they've been filed? Yeah. We'll answer all those questions. We're taking yeah. notes. No, I just wanted to make sure that we have it on record. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good question. Thank you. Hello, my name is T. Rue Williams, uh, Black Lives Matter, YJC, uh, LA Can. Um, you know, I'm lucky to be alive. You know, I know some of y'all probably never heard my story. Probably some of you have. Testify. That's right. Um, yeah. You know, the government, DOJ, Department of, yeah. <laughs> if you want to call it justification, because that's exactly what it was, uh, AI, uh, police accountability, that's what you are really here for. Defund the police. I want the police abolished. I don't want the police. In, right. It shouldn't be in no schoolhouse. Right. No. That should be out. Anything security. Uh, give police... Uh, take the guns for sure. They shouldn't have a gun. If they so upright and all this, they shouldn't even have a gun. Um, so I look at this. Let me see what I wrote down here. Oh, how much data do you need? Uh, of course. We know that people are getting killed constantly, every day. And we know it takes years for them to do this investigation that we know that we know that these people are getting killed. And we know it's unjustified. But y'all stay, steady letting these cops get away with it. In California, especially, L.A., especially, how many thousands of cops killed people? Thousands, I don't know, it's thousands. Because I, I think back in 2006, it was over a thousand. You know, that's when they was really killing people. That's when I got shot, right? Um, so, yeah, we know we got all this data. And we know that none of the police go to jail. They never get convicted either. Never. So how much data do you need? How much statistics do y'all need to actually do something? How, yeah, how much do y'all need to compile together? How many decades, how many years of information do you need to do your job? I just see it as incompetence. And I think a, a lot of y'all are incompetent. You know, I see a lot of y'all shouldn't even have a job. Give it to somebody else. You're incompetent. You shouldn't have a job. The police, you're incompetent. Get out the office. Whatever you're doing, you're not doing it right. That's, that's my message. Get out of there. Okay? What else we hear? Oh, the DA doesn't do nothing. The DA, the uh, Attorney General. Oh, who who is this talking about? The uh, who what? He, he said the Eternal Affairs. They all get the same check from the same person. The same people are paying. The, the, the name is on the check. It says the same thing. There's a school board, the police department. Then you keep going down the line. They all getting paid by the same person. So guess what? They're got. They're all gonna be obedient to whoever is signing the check. Let the people sign the check and see what happened. Let the people sign the check. That's what I say. Let us, the people, sign the check and see what happened. I say stop police murder. And when, when are we going to actually convict cops? That's another big question I have. When are we actually going to convict cops? Because we got all the statistics, we got all the data, you got it all compiled up, and you still ain't doing nothing. It's incompetence. Somebody needs to be out of office. And, and oh yeah, you tamper with evidence. Oh, yeah, oh my gosh. Let's talk about tampering with evidence now. Because you know uh, the Eternal Affairs, uh, Inspector General, DOJ, I mean, put all of them, uh, they all are getting signed this check by the same people. They are going to be obedient to this person. Let the people sign these checks. I bet you uh, there's going to be a whole lot of uh, stuff going on then. I bet you you're going to start convicting cops then. 
but I don't know how you you tamper with evidence and they don't get convicted. What's going on? We got videotapes. They turn off the mic. They, 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 what they, they, they change the, the statement. They Come on, y'all not going to convict them? How much statistics, how much data do you need? That's my answer. How much do you need? Thank you. Uh, my name is Ann Burdett. I'm with ICO, uh, uh, part of PICO. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I am so humbled by what has come before that what I have written down here seems irrelevant, but I'll say it anyway. I spent 25 years in teaching and I watched as the teaching profession became more accountable and more accountable to the point that I saw teachers who had not fulfilled their uh, it, continuing education requirements, get letters sent home to the parents to say they were not highly qualified. Test scores became the benchmark for how well a teacher was doing his or her job in the school. And I say, okay, because I'm a public servant. And public service requires scrutiny, and it requires transparency, and it requires trust. And so I bow to that. But what I'm wondering today, why don't these same criteria of transparency and trust apply to our officers in the police department? Gathering this stop data about uh, racial and identity profiling is important, but what action does it yield? You can train a whole department, and it isn't going to make a darn bit of difference until you identify the bad actors on the force who are committing these offenses. How can a police department hope to improve its performance if those of its members who are responsible for illegal activity are not identified and held accountable? In cases of sexual misconduct, why do we give police officers a pass and fire teachers? Families need to know the name of the person who killed their loved one. And they need to know what disciplinary action was taken. <laughs> Every single profession has some means by which its practitioners have their feet held to the fire. Lawyers get disbarred, teachers get fired, doctors face malpractice suits, even small businesses have Yelp. Reviews from their customers. Transparency yields corrective action. It's time to get real about our public servants in law enforcement, and that brings me to trust. This community does not trust law enforcement to police its own bad actors. Across America, only 30% of people across all racial communities trust that these agencies are doing an excellent or even good job of holding officers accountable for misconduct. Deaths by officer shootings deserve public scrutiny. Complaints of sexual assault have to be acknowledged, especially in the climate of the Me Too movement. Communities need to be able to trust law enforcement in order to cooperate in getting the bad guys. But when the bad guys are the officers, everyone loses. I can't imagine how demoralizing it would be for an officer to know that his or her partner on the beat is breaking the law and getting away with it. So we demand legislation that says that the actions of public servants are just that, public information. Perhaps transparency and trust can be restored in the California law enforcement and, uh, in community, but we urge that the RIPA board take the necessary steps to support the kind of legislation that brings transparency and trust back to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es María Antonio. Uh, yo vengo a apoyar a las mujeres que perdieron a sus a sus hijos, soy madre de tres, ah, de dos hombres y a ah, mi hijo me lo deportaron eh, creo que es más triste cuando ya no están con uno es más, más fuerte pero ah, vengo a apoyarlas en donde quiera que estén en migración Señora. y con ustedes Good afternoon. My name is Maria Antonio with ICO, and I'm here in support of the moms that have lost their sons. I personally have three, one of which was deported, but I 
I know that your pain is deeper. Tengo un hijo aquí de 28 años que también, um, al igual que todos los jóvenes, corren peligro en la calle porque no sabemos si cuidarnos de la policía o cuidarnos de de los de deportación. Eh, como mi hijo está trabajando, eh, pedirle a Dios que llegue bien a casa. I have a son here who is 24th and he always is careful from the police and she always prays that the police don't call him because they will handle him to immigration afterwards. Todos nosotros estamos aquí para que pedirle a la policía que así como nosotros los apoyamos que nos apoyen en el 2008 se metieron a mi casa y quisieron matarme. Um, yo cooperé con la policía y gracias a Dios no pasó nada. Pero así como nosotros cooperamos, también que la policía coopere con nosotros. She wants the police to call, collaborate. In 2008, they went to her house and they wanted to kill her almost killed her, but she collaborate, collaborated. Um, so she's in, she's in constant fear, and she wants to ha hold them accountable. En verdad que es muy triste saber que en cada esquina hay muchos jóvenes que los agarran sin necesidad por virarlos que son de color o que son latinos. Y cada día le pedimos nosotras como madres a Dios que regresen con bien nuestros hijos, porque eso es nuestro papel, tener a nuestros hijos con bien. Every day police are persecuting our sons because they are Latinos, they are people of color. They pray to God because they just want their, their son and family members to come home. Muchas gracias por su atención. Thank you so much for your attention. Gracias. Hi, my name is Alexa Castañon, and I'm from Long Beach, California. Um, I just come to you here to find out what is the, 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 the pursuit that you do to the police when they, you know, they, what they do on the whole day. This, how do you investigate them? How do you investigate the people who are doing bad? As, as a transgender, I have suffered a lot of time, you know, be pointed by the police or asking, Things like I don't should be asking if I so like one on, one day I was cooking like it was like seven or eight in the morning I'm sorry in the night it, and it was kind of I was missing something so I just went fast to the to the um, to the store and I kind of run a little bit because they, I don't want the uh, clo that store close early so I don't want to close me and let me uh, you know out with a thing that I needed for cooking and the police stopped me and he said what are you doing why are you running. And they said, oh, because I'm going to the store and, you know, I, I need to, they're going to close it. I don't want anything closer, so I, I was running. But then he started me asking, what do you do for a living? What is, your, uh -huh, what is your business? What is your identification? And I said, my name is Alexa Castañon. No, tell me your real name. And I said, wait, you, I don't have my license with me like that, but if you want it, let's go. And I went to get it and I brought it to, to them, but they still want to know what it was my real name. And I never said to them, but then he was like, like uh, he forced me and he told me like, he looking at my, in the computer, you know, for my name, with my ID, I said, you should be know if, you know, like, that's the, identif the identif identification that the judge gave me. So I, that's no fake ID. Because I asked him, why you ask me that question? And he, and he said, because this can be fake ID. I said, you should be know what is a fake ID. Yeah. You know, you should be know what is a fake ID. Why we in my community have to suffer for that? Why if you're walking on the street, like at nighttime, if you're going to the store or you're going to anywhere, they should, what, they should be not stop because you are transgender, because you look different. And I asked you, um, Mariana, that you're part of that, and I know you're part of that community, you know, and you know me like we all, I always trying to work with the community. 
And it's what we can do to, you know, to end in this. Because I don't want me, my friends, Laona, that I have better, you know, look. It's not that too much stuff. But before, when I start my transition, when I still was working, uh, uh, wearing a wig, I was driving and I was pulled up. What are you doing? Where are you going? Where is your driver's license? Right. They never say why they stopped me. No. They never say why they stopped me. And I always ask, why you stopped me? It was one day where I went, uh, we were dancing, and I had a, a friend that I met, you know, like, it was a, a transgender too, but it was a, a white girl. And then they stopped us. So they made me get out from the car and also to her. But my question was, why do the white girl, she wasn't, you know, like, revising her, her purse? And to my purse, they went to look for every part of my purse. And to the, the white girl, they didn't do nothing. I got so mad, even she told me, they, the cats should be not doing the, that, you know? Watch, why, why they did it to you? Do they know you? They, they, she told me, they know, I don't, I, you know, that this is the first time. But it's, it's hard. Sometimes, for me, it's hard to walk on the, like, if, another, another occasion that happened in Long Beach too, is one day I, I, I like, I left my key inside my house, and I wasn't able to get inside. I had to walk to, because my brother, he lived like a few blocks. I had to walk on the street, on Long Beach Boulevard. And I know the police stopped me, too, and he said, what are you doing here? And I told him, playing here, like, are you sure? Can you please uh, wrap it up? Yeah. Thank you. And then he was like, follow me to see where he's going. You know, like, he didn't, you know, like, go away i still continue walking and i don't know why 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 we had to suffer that you know it's kind of hard we are like ready you know come back to for the community from the community even sometimes for our family and to be you know afraid to come if i you know like many girls if they they got somebody got robbed them they they're afraid to call the police because the police going to come and ask what do you do for living why you did you know like start asking questions that they don't supposed to be go with that right now you find a victim why did you be call me asking questions me you should be me ask questions about the pe person who did to me something you know so i'm here to fight with them and also like to the mothers that they lost their kids thank, thank you, you. Just, uh, just a little bit of a procedural here. We, uh, we estimate if there's at least 14 more people behind. We're going to allow one more speaker, and then we're going to take a 15-minute break. Go on with the agenda. As you see in the agenda, there is another public comment period at the end. What I do ask um, is be respectful. Uh, look in front of you and behind you, those who are remaining to, to speak, and that you allow that same order uh, to go at the second comment period so everyone gets a fair opportunity to speak in, in the uh, position that they're waiting for. So let's just have one more public speaker, and we're going to take a break after that. Thank you, ma'am. My name is Antoinette. I'm the sister of Angel Ramos, who was killed by Officer Zachary Jacobson in Vallejo, California. Um, I just want to touch on a few issues. One, Lori brought up the issue of, of the children being traumatized. And um, in the autopsy report, we just re we just received, after being denied the autopsy report over three times, um, we finally received it. And it says in the report that they contacted my mom um, after my brother was killed, but that was a lie. It was my nine-year-old nephew that had to call my mom. It was my nine-year-old nephew that had to that had to be brave and, and call me while I was out here in school and text me and say, TT, I need you to call me because the police just killed Angel. My nine-year-old nephew, my brother was killed on the back porch. We have a front door. They had the option to take my nephew through the front door. Instead, they made him walk over my brother's body not once but twice. I was visiting back home this summer. It was around 4th of July, and we don't really think much of it. Fireworks are going off. Um, but I remember my nephew, he woke up out of bed and he peed the bed and he was already about 10 years old, like a year later, not even 10. So he was still nine. Um, and he, he couldn't think like, why did I pee the bed? He was so embarrassed. Why did I pee the bed? Why did I pee the bed? But it didn't trigger that just five minutes before he woke up out of, out of his sleep from peeing the bed as those fireworks just went off. And so we talked about earlier of the PTSD, um, 
that that we're facing and what y'all officers don't understand and i just find it funny that you're the commentator over who, how much time we have left it just kind of finds it i just find it funny how y'all also decide to make those decisions for our lives of how much time we have left and so the audacity of y'all to sit here like she said to sit here and hold up signs that say time's up y'all can shove that up your ass honestly because y'all didn't sit here and give us an option of when we wanted our time to be up or y'all didn't give my brother an option when his time was up y'all took that from him yeah. I'm standing up here on behalf of my mom as well, because she can't be here. But y'all don't understand the trauma that, that y'all caused. Y'all take away one life, but y'all destroy y'all destroy families. Y'all, My spirit is never going to be the same. My heart is never going to be the same. My soul is, is broken. My heart is broken forever. And so what y'all don't understand is that just because you take this one body physically, you have left us, you, you've left us here broken, like... You, you left us here broken spiritually, mentally. I've had to been into mental facilities because of the trauma and the depression that I'm say, that I'm that I'm facing over this situation. Um, y'all just I don't know. Y'all just don't get it until it's one of y'all. And we sit here talk about good cops and bad cops. And like I said earlier in the back, and I don't know if you heard it, but this is going straight to you, Edward. Ain't no such thing as a good cop. The only good cop is a dead one. And I don't give a damn. Take it how you want to. Because y'all don't give a damn about our people. Y'all don't care. Y'all don't care. Y'all sit up here. What if it was y'all kids? We sit up here and we yell our people's name. And y'all sit here in silence and don't say shit. Y'all don't say their name with us. So what I'm finna sit here and say is I want every single last one of y'all to say my brother named Angel Ramos. Angel Ramos. Angel Ramos. And it's still some of y'all sitting up there with y'all mouth closed, the audacity that y'all have. And I'm sitting here asking you, it's not much to ask of just to say my brother's name and to let him know, like I said earlier, he's more than just a statistic. He's more than just a number. He is a human being. My brother was only 21 years old. And how she said, we ain't ashamed to tell our brother's story. My brother, over a year, was on drugs. He, he flipped his life around a few months before he was killed. He only had a few months to live that life how he truly wanted to live that life. We didn't even get a chance to see my brother make that complete turnaround how we've been praying for. We prayed so much for my brother to get up out of that, that situation. And when he finally did, lo and behold, he had to be taken by the hands of police. My mom moved to Vallejo out of Oakland to get my brothers out of the street, away from the danger of the street, and then they turn around and get killed by the hands of the people that are supposed to protect and serve. What are y'all doing? So it's the real question is that we might as well stay at our ass in Oakland if that's the case. Y'all y'all not doing nothing. Y'all sit here with these blank faces, but it's still as y'all, when, when it's one of y'all, y'all want to sit and have these big ass parades for y'all funeral. Y'all want to sit and have these big ass parades. Like like y'all just like 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 he said, ain't no such thing as no damn blue life. Your skin is not no fucking blue. That's a uniform. We can't take our skin off. We gotta wake up in this skin every day. Y'all y'all take that uniform off when y'all go home. Y'all get to go home to y'all families. We don't. My mom can't even say my brother's name without crying, and it's been over a year. His name cannot even come out her mouth without her eyes watering up. Y'all don't get that. That is trauma. So until it is, it must take, you know, two of us, ten of y'all, that must be what it's going to take until y'all see something. Because the moment it's one of y'all, then all hell want to fucking break loose. Like I wouldn't, let me just say, last thing I want to say here is fuck the police. Fuck you. Fuck your family. Fuck your kids. Fuck all of that. Because y'all don't give a damn about us. So say his name, Angel Ramos. Say his name. Say his name. Angel Ramos. Fuck the police. So it's it's twelve thirty. What we're gonna ask folks to do is let's take let's take a fifteen minute bio break. We're gonna come back and we're gonna do some board discussion. Open it back up for the folks in public comment and then finish with selecting the new board chair. Fifteen minutes outside. I believe there are refreshments. There's food and coffee. Fifteen minutes. We'll reconvene at 1245.